The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. Karen, why are you holding all these objects? Well, since we're finished with the super glue gun, mm -hmm. we're almost completed with the mini pinball, right. and we have this fancy new Pi Portable, I thought it was time to invite back James Ray to talk about product viability. Oh yeah, so we talked to James Ray a few months ago regarding the Hex board game. He works with Avid, which is a company that is part of Avnet, the parent company of Newark and Element 14, on bringing products to market and evaluating them for their manufacturability. So we talked to him already about the Hex game, so in today's episode, we're gonna call him up via Skype and talk about the Super Glue Gun, the Mini Pinball, and the Pi Portable. Let's get started. Amazing Hacks. Should we take it for a spin? Inspired Designs. Imhotep's Priests. Regrettable Acting. No one seems to get it. Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. How's it going, James? Good, how about yourself, Ben? Uh, pretty good, uh, we have some projects here to show you. It's nice to see you again. Right, so the last time you were here in person, we were talking about the Hex game. So now we have a few other prototypes that we wanted to show you that weren't quite finished when you were here. Uh, yeah, two of them we talked about, which, you know, we talked about the mini pinball and the super glue gun, but we also built something else in the meantime that got a really positive reaction online. This thing right here is totally awesome. It's a Raspberry Pi and a screen and a keyboard all driven directly with the, H, uh, the GPIO. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, there's there's a lot of hand wiring that was done. Yeah, I but see we're that. thinking, wow. you know, if obviously if that could all be done as a PCB, you just plug it into an existing Pi and then you go for it, like an A plus or something. Uh, yeah. So, do you have any opinions on that? Like, what it takes to make? I mean, basically, it'd be like an add-on board for the Raspberry Pi, like the kind of thing Adafruit's always making. Yeah. So. Um well, there's a couple ideas there. Um, but first of all, are you using any of the wireless functionality with no. the uh, Pi? No. We're using the A plus and A the plus. zero, okay. the regular zero. We don't have the zero W or the Pi three. Okay. One way that you could do it um, is use a compute module. Have you looked down that avenue at all? <laughs> yes, we are. We we are definitely. Familiar with the compute module. Uh, we contemplated it for a bit. That would add some thickness though because of that sodium yeah, slot. But, yeah, that, that's a, a pretty impressive assembly you have there. So it, it, would, it would be a shame to add thickness to it. The other option beyond uh, a compute module is to do a custom Pi. Um, so basically we would take all the Pi internals and do a single PCB um, that would uh, include all your you know, requirements. Um, and that's something that Avid can do. Really? Um, so we, we are the only company in the world that can do Pi customizations. So we have an exclusive agreement with Raspberry Pi Trading Company and we can customize um, a design around the, the Broadcom Silicon and basically implement everything that you would that would be uh, software compatible with the existing Pi's. That's pretty cool. That sounds expensive. It depends, it depends on what needs Kickstarter. to be Kickstarter! Because deep so, down inside every Broadcom chip, there's some sort of EEPROM or hard setting that tells it what it is, right? Because when you like when you boot up the system and the device tree overlay, you know, has all those options mm -hmm. like Pi 3, Pi 3 CM, and like we adjust those. Right. There's something inside the Broadcom that looks at that and says, I know at the factory I'm a Pi, a Pi compute module, even though it's technically the same silicon as like yeah. a Raspberry Pi 1. Right. So, yeah, and that's that's like for the, the boot sequence and things like that, that's where that's used. Um, there's secure boot options as well, that there's some uh, like one-time uh, writable registers within the uh, silicon that, that are used for that. And then it knows based off of that what sort of parameters to boot off of the media. Right. Huh. I mean, is there? can you give us a ballpark on custom Pi silicon design? Well, not silicon design, but you know, board design. Yeah, so, so the board design would really have to account for how much from the original Pi you would want changed. Uh, but we have that pretty streamlined uh, where we can kind of look at your requirements, what you want added, what you want removed, and then we can customize it around that. Um, so we have the design files to begin with, so we can go through that process really quickly. And then we can use our uh, 
sister company in, in China to do the full uh, assembly from there. I thought they were made so, in yeah. the UK. There's two there's two uh, fabricators or two assemblers that are used, and uh, we are uh, one of the two. Are we talking like five grand, ten grand, <laughs> fifty grand? For the NRE for the development. What is NRE? Uh, non-recurring engineering costs, so just like one-time costs okay. for like development. You know that you're looking. Uh, you know, depending on how much is changing, is you know five to five to fifteen k somewhere in there, five five to ten maybe. Um, and then as far as uh, unit cost, uh, because it's no longer a standard pie anymore, right. the unit costs would be higher than what you would get normally. But if you factor in all the other boards that you have around there and cabling and you know optimizing for the enclosure that's where the it could be cost effective hmm that's interesting i did not i was not aware the service existed that's really cool with regard to that service um when it comes to designing the board and everything to what extent are the uh, design files what's who does the designing and how, how so much do we are we involved or how much is if you, yeah, um, so yeah do we give so you like a form factor target or what yes yep so you would give us the pcb outline that you wanted uh, targeted. Uh, we have access to the design files um, and we have an exclusive with that so we can share them with uh, the end customer, but certainly you can be part of the, the review process, certainly the approval process. So that's that's where uh, we have to kind of segment the, the effort. That would be everything. super ultra <laughs> mega time. I wonder if people would buy it. I think that's what, that's what we need to figure out, you know? Like think about something like this, like all the adapters we have, like what if it was basically like a board that had the Pi on it and you plug the uh, standard 40 pin LCD into it and boom, it works. You know, you don't need HDMI, you just direct drive it with the pins. Correct. And then, you know, if it's, if it's kind of like a custom compute module, then we get all that extra I.O. as well that we typically lose when we do this. You we, know, could, we could have an additional header with all that extra I.O. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like 20, 20 more pins, I want to say. Basically, I would want a Raspberry Pi 3 without Wi-Fi that boots off an SD card. Because then, if the person wants Wi-Fi, they can plug in the module, you know? Right. That way, right. we wouldn't have to worry about it, right? Yeah, that yeah. would make sense. This sounds really cool. My personal thought is, I don't know, I, I don't think we were able to improve enough to really make it justifiable. Because the first time we built one of these, you know, we didn't bother making a, a cool case or designing any of that. We just took a bunch of components and like taped them together. <laughs> you know, like you were holding the yeah. motor and the trigger and not a whole lot of thought was put into it. And that one, all it was about was the controlled extrusion. Whereas with this one, I was like, oh, there could be an indicator light and there could be a uh, light sensor in case you, you know, go to bed and leave it on. It could beep, you know, I had all these, all these ideas. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, sadly, we got to like the, the end of our schedule, you know, like we everything had to be done this month. And we're like, okay, let's just get this together into a complete prototype. And uh, I didn't get it as far as I, I would have liked. Well, uh, any thoughts on the glue gun or uh, what's your take? I know we've already discussed it a little bit. As far as like uh, selling it or? Uh, well, that's the thing. It's like, it. is it even, what is the market there? I mean, I know three yeah. doodler pen, 3D doodler pens were really popular for a while. Yeah, I, I would say that's probably a, a tough sell. I mean, it looks like it was a really fun engineering project, though. Definitely right. mechanically. Um, you probably ran into lot, all kinds of challenges there, but that was pretty tough. That's kind of out of my, uh, my, my comfort zone. So probably, uh, you know, send the glue gun off into the great beyond. Yeah, set, put it in some kind of museum. It's <laughs> uh, it's a clever design, though. I mean, you, you got a lot of thought into it. All we'll right, so again. why don't we set that aside, and then we'll talk about the last project. All right, okay. our final product was a miniature pinball kit, and that's what you have here. It was based off our Super Space Shuttle game that we took to, uh, what was that? It was for a Freescale event, right? Yeah, because it had the... Um, team team. Uh, yeah, so what are, your, what are your thoughts as far as production? That's a challenge. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of pieces to it. Um, so mechanically, the kit idea and kind of piecing together all the individual pieces and minimizing that cost, obviously, is a big deal. Have you taken any kind of designs through, like, pre-compliance on the way 
to intent of uh, sale at all? With this? No, we haven't thought about that at all. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that would be one of the things that, you know, you've got longer cables in the box and all that kind of stuff that mm-hmm. could come into play. I see that your cables are twisted, so that's good. That helps reduce the loop area. Um, but yeah, so as far as mechanicals go, you know, that's kind of out of my specialty area. Um, but it, it definitely is a slick idea. And I think if you can uh, make it reasonably documented how to put the thing together, it, it should should be a pretty cool project, I would think. That's kind of what it would look like. So the board would be in the back and the cables would go there. Okay. And so yeah, you've got signal, signal, and then these are 12 volt power cables right there. Okay. So we could probably isolate those. And then yeah, you have a wooden box, you know, which could probably act as a big capacitor if you're not careful. I wonder if like, yeah, the MakerBot people, remember their first main product was like, laser cut wood. I wonder if they'd have some tips on that. Yeah, I mean, so with the solenoids, usually, you know, you slam them hard initially and then you hold them with a certain frequency. Yep. Uh, so those, that's where you would need to be careful. Sometimes you want to put things out of phase from each other so that uh, it doesn't reinforce that harmonic uh, for emissions. Um, oh. And, then, and also you can play with the, the actual frequency itself and that can help reduce the, the possibility of kind of reinforcing uh, problematic. Harmonic. So you're saying you're saying the hold pulse would be more of a problem than actually the initial slam pulse? Yeah, usually you know it's it's all about current um, for emissions, and you know even though that initial pulse is uh, where the highest current is going to be, it's a, it's a much shorter time, that, especially with that kind of a load that would be on that. Um, you know, it's it's that hold current is usually the more uh, problem since it's more prevalent as far as timing goes. Yeah, I want to say that it's uh, off the top of my head, 100 hertz, it's pretty slow, and they aren't out of phase. So if you're holding both, they're both being pulsed at the, on the same on the same phase. Right, but I mean, they right. can be made to alternate quite easily. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, this, this is probably something where, obviously the mechanical stuff isn't really, that I don't, that's not really you guys' wheelhouse, is it, so much? No, I mean, we, we have mechanical partners that, that do dynamic stuff like this, but we're electronic assembly people. Right. Um, we definitely deal with cables and emissions problems and solenoids and things like that. Uh, but, yeah, that's that's a little bit out of our specialty area. Okay, but as a, as a product, you like it? Oh, yeah. No, I, I think it's a great, a great kid idea, um, and it's playable, it's fun, and... Uh, Definitely something that involves a lot of different understanding, which is kind of cool. So the mechanical side as well as the electrical side uh, looks like it'd be pretty fun. Well, that was fun talking to James Ray about these three projects that we finished the prototypes for. So in conclusion, the glue gun is scrapped because it doesn't really have enough features that function well. Yeah, it pretty much turned out the least good of Mm -hmm. all the three things that we worked on. Yeah, and while we love the mini pinball, it's a very complicated product to try to take to market. I think it would probably take a couple years to actually get this to the point where it's something that we could deliver as a kit. And we still need to do some more prototyping. Which we will. But something like this is totally within our wheelhouse. Mm And then we learned that they have custom Raspberry Pi manufacturing capabilities. Yeah. If you're willing to pay the money. So I think that could be something really cool to look at. So what we're gonna do in future episodes is finish up the pinball machine and also maybe look into making a custom PCB to do this. So this could be basically a kit. Mm -hmm. So you get the PCB screen and a battery, you put it together, maybe you 3D print your own case, boom, you can have this device. So of the three builds we started with, the hex game we still really like, We're gonna see if we could potentially take it to market. Yep. And then we had this baby creep up, so we're gonna look into this one as well and see if uh, we can turn this into a cool little kit. Yeah, it was kind of interesting that um, along the way we kind of shifted gears and the projects we shifted gears into ended up being the best ones. Mm -hmm. So that's why you should always be willing to like erase things and destroy them if they're not working out, or at least be open to changing them drastically. Well, that's all the time we have for today. What do you think about these three projects? Which one is your favorite? Tell us about it on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash TBHS. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. Karen, I hear that today we're going to finish up the mini pinball kit. 
Oh yeah, we have reached the end. So we have it physically done. We just have to create some art, sound, code, scoring, and then test it. I need my bang. Yeah, I just quoted Star Trek V. What are you gonna do?